Good morning, good morning, good morning to you, good morning to you. We're all in our places with sunshiny faces, and this is the way to start a new day. Good morning. I am here. I tried to do another video last night, but it kept freezing, so hopefully I don't get a lot of freezing today. That is my hope, as we got quite a bit of catch up to still do. So that is my hope. <coughs> so I'm going to give this a few moments. And then we will get started. Although, I don't know. Everyone's probably getting ready for church, which I will do in a little while. I'm already prepped. But I'm up, and I want to catch up. I really, really do. So, I am here, hopefully, to get the catch up going. I have my window open. So, if you hear traffic, that's why. I'm having my own private summers these days. All right, let's give this maybe a few more seconds. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, we are in First Samuel doing chapters 21 through 25, which would have actually been last Wednesday's reading. We are on the catch up. Um, and we left off in our last video um, with pretty much um, uh, David solidifying with Jonathan that, hey, your daddy want to kill me. Your daddy really, really does want to kill me. Um, Jonathan didn't believe it at first until Saul tried to kill him uh, just for... Um, bringing up a conversation with David. So that led him to uh, really believe David when he said, your daddy's trying to kill me. Um, and so we get the last exchange between um, David and Jonathan. Um, and then now um, we open up with chapter 21 and David is actually on the run. So he is on the run. Um, and pretty much for all of the chapters that we're about to go over, uh, he is on the run for the rest of First Samuel to the very end, almost. Uh, but he starts off and he runs to uh, the priest, Ahimelech, um, who is um, the priest that is in Nob. And so he's not the high priest. Um, but if you remember when they were setting up territories, when we read about that, there were each priest was going to be given... Um, um, you know, some territory. So there was the high priest that stayed with the tabernacle, but then there were other priests that were going to be sort of uh, uh, living around there and Levites that were given land to live around there. And so this was Elimelech. And so he went to Elimelech and Elimelech thought something was wrong at first. He was like, basically, why are you coming by yourself? Like, you're not with the king because everybody knew like he was the king's right-hand man for a while. Uh, he was Saul's son-in-law, right? Because he married Saul's daughter. Um, he at one time had been Saul's armor bearer. Um, and now he was like, not the head of his army, but holding his own in Saul's army, right? Remember the song that um, they sang, Saul kills his thousands and David kills his ten thousands. And so people knew who David was, uh, but they knew him in relation to Saul. And so they were like, what's going on? You know, Ahimelech is like, why are you here? And so David gave him some story about he was coming to represent the king. And, you know, my men are here. They just, you know, on the outskirts, you know, watching for me or whatever. Um, and he's trying to get some provisions for um, um, himself. 
um, and his men. And uh, Ahimelech says, well, all I have is like the, the bread of the presence. And um, if you've been following along with us, you know the bread of the presence or the show bread, which it is sometimes called, is the bread that was supposed to be kept um, um, fresh, right? Um, and kept on the table um, for the Lord. And it was always there, but it was exchanged. And so um, he wasn't giving them the bread fresh off the table. He was giving them that chain, you know, here's the fresh bread. We just took this bread off, but you still can't eat this bread because the priest, that was the priest portion. So you can't eat this bread unless you're clean. And so um, David assures them, hey, me and my men, we ain't been with no women. You know, we clean. Uh, we're ceremonially clean so we can eat the bread. And then he asked them for a sword. Um, and it's like, you know, do you have a sword? You know, cause I, I was running over here really quick to get away, you know, to not to get away. He said, I was running over here really quick. So, you know, that I could do what Saul was asking me to do. I had to come and do what Saul and I left without my sword. Right. Um, and he said, well, all I have is the sword of Goliath that, you know, that you took from him. And David's like, okay, fine. I'll take that. Give me the sword of Goliath. Um, and then, um, he, uh, flees from there, right? He runs from there and then he goes to Ashish, the king of Gath, right? So he goes to Ashish, um, but the servants of Ashish, uh, see him there and they're like, isn't this David? Um, and it was too, we're going to see he goes back there later, but this was too soon. Like he was still associated with Saul. Hey, Toya. He was still associated with Saul and uh, people knew it. And so here he is in another kingdom that Saul would usually fight against. And um, the servants of that kingdom is like, that look like David. They must be plotting something, right? So um, they're trying to go tell their master, the king, David is here. Something's up, right? Uh, so David realizes this, and what does he do? He plays crazy, y'all. I mean, crazy. He likes to start slobbing at the mouth and beating on walls and, you know, beating on the gate and just crazy. So by the time they take him to Ashish, all Ashish is, is this crazy man. You know, it's, it's slob all down, foaming at the mouth, slob all down his beard. Um, beating on the walls, and I, mean, I imagine he's just looking around like he's crazy. And so, um, um, Ashish, uh, the king, was like, why y'all bring me this crazy man talking about this David? Obviously, this is not David. So, David was a pretty good actor, y'all, uh, because Ashish was fooled. He was like, obviously, this is not David. Don't I got enough crazy people, you know, in my court, you know, then y'all bringing me one? You know, just, just get this man out of here, right? And so David um, um, actually got out of, you know, being captured uh, by, by playing crazy. And then um, he escaped from there. Um, and um, from there, people started hearing that he was on the run, his family, right? And so um, verse, chapter 22, verse uh, 1 says, um, David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about him, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. And uh, if you've been with the life um, uh, in any of our messages in the last uh, year or so, Bishop has preached on this a couple of times and talked about how uh, David was the leader um, first before he became king of all Israel. And we're going to see that um, he does become king of all Israel eventually. But before that, he was king of these 400 men. Um, he became the leader of those. But these were, you know, his family, some were his family, some were his friends. But all of them, the Bible says, um, were distressed or in debt or discontented, right? So David uh, took a, a set of 400 people who were in debt, distressed, or discontented and led those first. That was interesting to me, right? 
um, before he took on a big, huge task of leading all of Israel, he sort of got to lead a, a, a portion or a faction of them. Um, and I guess some would say the worst faction, right? Uh, because, you know, they're the complainers, they're the whiners, they're the ones with the problems. Um, they're the ones that you really got to, you know, lead, right? Um, and so, you know, God did not send him 400 men who are fully resourced um, and able to, you know, give him everything that he needed. That's not what happened. They were in debt, so they brought nothing to David, right? Uh, David was, was uh, looking for ways to feed them. Right, so they brought nothing to the game, uh, but they were willing to follow David. Um, he left there and went to Moab. Um, um, he wanted his mother and father to have somewhere safe to stay uh, because you know he didn't know if Saul was going to get so dirty that he was going to actually go after Jesse and um, you know his mother. And so uh, he took his mother and father to the king of Moab and said, "Hey, can you just hold on to my parents?" Um, and the king of Moab agreed. And so um, he left his parents there. Um, and then he went to Judah, right? So David left and he went to Judah. Now, in the meantime, Saul hears that Ahimelech helped David, right? So he calls Ahimelech to him. Remember, that was the priest. He calls Ahimelech to him and says, what is this? Uh, why are you helping me? you know, my successor, basically. And Ahimelech says, well, how was I supposed to know that, right? Let's listen to what he said um, in verse 14 of chapter 22. He said, who of all your servants is as loyal as David, the king's son-in-law, captain of your bodyguard, and highly respected in your household? Was that day the first time I inquired of God for him? Of course not. Let not the king accuse your servant or any of his father's family, for your servant knows nothing at all about this whole affair. In other words, this ain't the first time David came to me and I inquired of the Lord for him. He was your boy. He was your right-hand man. He's your son-in-law. Why would I think anything was wrong? I don't know anything about anything that's going on, is basically what Himelech said. But remember, y'all, the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul. Spirit of God was off Saul, had departed from Saul. So Saul was a very wicked man. And so he said, you know what? You about to die today. Um, and he uh, ordered his men to kill um, uh, the priest. <laughs> and his men was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, you lost your mind. We're not laying our hands on the priest. We, you know, whatever you say, yes, sir. But killing priests, you 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 know that that's a step up from what we are willing to do, right? Or a step down even from what we are willing to do. Um, and the reason why uh, Saul found out in the first place that um, uh, David was even at uh, Ahimelech's uh, place is because there was this guy there that saw him that was a uh, uh, Edomite. Uh, and remember the Edomites come from, um, uh, I'm taking you way back, remember Jacob and Esau, and Esau was called Edom because he was red, right? And so the people were the Edomites, so they came from uh, Jacob's brother Esau, his twin brother Esau were the Edomites. So um, uh, here you have, so they were uh, uh, related, but not uh, God's chosen, right? Um, so here you have Doeg, I guess that's how you say his name, D-O-E-G, um, has seen David at the, uh, uh, Ahimelech's house. Um, and so when the men refused to kill the priest, here you have this Edomite saying, oh, I'll do it. And he kills 85 priests, 85. I mean, he kills the uh, Ahimelech and all his kids and all the successors, everything, 85 priests. That would be the equivalent of somebody, um, you know, walking into Detroit saying, you know, I'm going to kill 85 preachers. That, what? 85 preachers. Just, I'm just going to go kill them and all their families. Right? I'm going to kill them and all their families. Uh, so he killed them all except one. Um, 
And that was Abiathar who escaped. And he escaped and ran to David and told David what happened. Uh, and David felt bad because he was like, man, when I saw Doeg, the Edomite there, I had a feeling he was going to go and, you know, uh, tell Saul that he saw me. So this is on me. Like the the 85 priests, all your family that died, Abiathar, that's on me. Um, and he basically told Abiathar, stick with me. Uh, same person trying to kill you is trying to kill me. I'm not going to let him kill me, so I'm not going to let him kill you. So Abiathar goes with David. Um, so Saul continues to run after David, right? He's still looking for him. Um, and um, in the running after him, um, uh, I'll read verse 20. I'm saying, sorry, chapter 23, verse 1. It says, when David was told, Look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are looting the threshing floors. He inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I go and attack the Philistines? So David is like, okay, I know I'm on the run, but I mean, God, do you want me to war still on behalf of Israel? Um, and the Lord is like, yeah, go get them. And so he tries to go and tell his men, and they're like, mm, are you sure? Because uh, we, don't, we don't really see that, right? We don't really see us going to fight them. Have you seen how many it is, right? Uh, so they're like, we can't go against the Philistine forces. So David, um, instead of just listening to the people and saying, okay, well, we won't go, he goes back to the Lord and says, um, Am I really supposed to go to Keilah? And God says, yes, go. I am going to give the Philistines into your hands. Um, so they went up to Keilah, Keilah, fought the Philistines, and, and, you know, slaughtered them and carried away everything from them. Uh, and so uh, Saul was told that they were down there um, in Keilah. So, of course, he goes running, um, thinking he can get David that way. Um and so when David heard that Saul was on his way, um, he told Abiathar, bring me the ephod. I need to inquire of the Lord, right? Um, and so he tells him, um, if I stay here in Keilah, he asked the Lord, if I stay here in Keilah, will these people hide me or will they give me up? And the Lord tells him, they're going to give you up. They're going to write you out. They're going to tell Saul exactly where you are. So even though he had came down there to help, he's like, no, they're going to. They're going to rat you out. So David runs. And by the time Saul gets to Keilah, David is not there anymore. And so they're on this running pattern. Day after day after day, they run. Uh, David runs one place. Saul finds him. David runs another place. Saul finds him. And this goes on for a while, guys. This is David's life. And if you, uh, when we get to the book of Psalms, um, the Song of Songs, right? The book of Songs which is the book of a whole bunch of songs, um, we will talk about um, some of these uh, uh, songs that were written, um, David wrote while he was on the run. And you can hear the tone of how he was writing them. Um, um, in a lot of them, he was discouraged. He was um, confused. He was like, God, why is this happening to me? And why won't you just, you know, crush my enemies? And he was on the run for quite some time. Um, and uh, he pours his heart out about it in some of the Psalms that we will read when we get to the book of Psalms. Um, we go on and David is running. Uh, he ran uh, to Ziph, but the Ziphites ratted him out and told Saul exactly where he was. Um, and so they went trying to find him. Um, and they were going up one mountain and David was going down another. They were on one side of the mountain. David was on the other side of the mountain. They were just trying to find each other, right? Well, David was running and Saul was trying to find him. Um, if you go to chapter 24, um, um, David has an opportunity to actually kill Saul and doesn't. And this to me is a very, very important scripture. So I'll read it to you for um, starting at verse... Let's start at verse 1 of chapter 24. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told David is in the desert of En Gita. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way, 
a cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now, I'll stop here and tell you the rest. So, a cave was there, and, you know, there were no bathrooms back then. Uh, and so, they would relieve themselves in caves or wherever they could. So, he chose this cave to go in and relieve himself. Um, and it actually happened to be a cave that David's men were hiding in. Him and uh, David and his men were hiding in the cave that Saul chose to relieve himself. But they were way, way back in the cave, um, so Saul could not see them. And so... Um, uh, of course, his man is like, let's kill him, let's kill him, let's kill him. Uh, but David is like, no, 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 we, we're not going to kill him. Uh, basically, he says, uh, because this man was once anointed. This is awesome, y'all. Because this is man was once anointed. He was once set apart for God's work. Uh-oh. Because this man was once anointed, he was once set apart for for God's word, I can't touch him, right? Let, let me read it to you. Um, what he does do is, is like clip off a piece of his robe because he's going to show Saul that I could have killed you and I didn't. But he even feels guilty about doing that. Um, let's go to verse 5. Afterward, David was conscious stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master. Still calling him his master. Now this man is chasing him all over, everywhere, trying to find him. And yet he still calls him his master. He said, the Lord's anointed or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. And so David was like, no, this man is anointed. It's like, yes, God took his hands off of him, but it doesn't matter. God's hands was once on him. And so he's anointed and I can't touch him. That is, I think, uh, a mindset that that is like lost, 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 lost for this generation. We have come become so common with the men and women of God that when they do something wrong, um, when they do something wrong, they, you know, they can't even, um, uh, you know, uh, not say face. That's not what I'm trying to say. But get redemption from the people of God, right? Um, people are through with you. They will uh, uh, turn you over uh, to whoever. They will burn bread on you. They will do whatever, right? Uh, because people have lost the respect and the honor. But here David was in the right, y'all, in the right. Um, um, let me see. I'm answering someone whose video went out. Um, he was in the right, y'all. Um, he was the one running, and Saul was trying to kill him for no other reason than uh, I'm jealous of you, right? And you about to be the next king. And if I kill you, maybe that won't happen, right? Um, and so for no other reason, he was in the right. But yet it's still... Uh, while this man is trying to kill him, actively trying to kill him, um, he still won't lay a hand on him. So I think that's something um, very honorable of David is that he won't lay a hand on a man he calls master, still loyal to Saul to the end, and, and rebuke this man. Hey, 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 I don't care what you say. Don't talk about him. Look, I don't care what you say. That's that's. You know, don't lay a hand on him. I don't care what you say. Don't do anything, right? Rebuke his men. And so David then shows Saul, you know, he goes a, a, a distance away and shows Saul, I could have killed you, right? Uh, listen to what he says. Um, verse 9, he said to Saul, why do, you, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. And then verse 12 is going to be our memory verse. So chapter 24, verse 12 says, May the Lord judge 
between you and me. And may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me. But my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil deeds. So my hand will not touch you. And that was uh, chapter 24 of First Samuel. And we're going to do verses 12 and 13. I'll read it to you one more time. May the Lord judge between you and me. And may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me. But my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evil doers come evil deeds. So my hand will not touch you. And so I want you to make this a memory verse. Because sometimes, you know, we got enemies. We got people that we would love to put our hands on, right? Um, you're going to have to read this and get the spirit of David um, in you when that happens. Because basically David said um, in that verse 13, evil, do, evil deeds come from evil doers. So if I do an evil thing, I become an evil doer. Get it? If I do an evil thing, I become an evil doer, right? And so David basically is saying, I'm not going to become who you are in order to get you. And that's what we've got to learn when we're dealing with our enemies. We have to learn that when we stoop to their level, we become exactly what we say we hate about them, right? Exactly what we say that we don't like about them. Exactly what we say that we dishonor about them, we become that when we stoop to their level. And David says, I'm not going to do it. Evil doers, evil deeds come from evil doers. And I'm not an evil doer. Therefore, I will not do an evil deed. Ah, oh, did you get that? Did you get that? So yeah, memorize this scripture, y'all. Especially those of y'all that always got haters, right? Everybody got haters, right? Uh, you really need to memorize this for your haters so that you can understand that you don't need to stoop, stoop to their level. Once you do, you become the evildoer uh, because you've done evil deeds. All right, so Saul goes through this whole production where he's, weeping and he's sorry and I don't know what's going I don't know what's come over me and I swear and I promise I'm gonna stop chasing you uh, you are my son you're just like a son to me he goes through all of that right um but it, you'll see he'll be right back at it in uh, in the next chapter um or two um in chapter 25 um we start off with Samuel's death so Samuel passes and uh, the whole congregation mourns his passing. Um, he died. Remember, uh, uh, we started off First Samuel um, uh, with Samuel, uh, his mother, uh, praying for him um, and then promising, God, if you give me a son, I will let him live in the temple all the days of his life. And exactly what Samuel did, right? Um, and then uh, we have this next story in chapter 25 about uh, Nabal and his wife, Abigail. And so basically, remember, David's got the discontent, the people that are in debt, uh, you know, the discouraged. He's got all these D people with him, right? Um, and so they're coming to him um, uh, to help him in fighting, but he's got to be the provision maker um, and figure out how he's going to feed all these 400 people that have aligned themselves. And so he goes um, to uh, Nabal, who's a very rich man along the way. Um, he has property and wealth, thousands of goats, 3,000 sheep. Just He's in overabundance, right? Um, and the Bible says he also has a wife that's intelligent and beautiful. I love it. Uh, verse 3 says... Uh, his name was Nabal and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband was surly and mean in his dealings. Um, and so David basically goes to him and says, hey, can you give us some provisions, right? Can you give us, you know, some food, some water, give us some stuff. I mean, you're rich, right? What is it to you to give it to 400 men? You, you got it going on. And you're not even going to miss whatever you give to us, right? And listen to what Nabal says. Uh, he, and David didn't go. David sent his servants to ask because, I mean, it was supposed to be a no-brainer. I send my servants and you send back with food, right? But listen to what he said. Who is this David? I'm in verse 10 of chapter 25. Who is this son of Jesse? 
Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men coming from who knows where? Can you imagine, right? David is like, what? Did he just, what? What? What happened? Um, and so his servants come back to him and tell him what Nabal says. And listen at the first thing David says after they tell him what Nabal says. Uh, verse 13, David said to his men, each of you strap on your sword. So they did. And David strapped on his sword. So David, like he said, what? Man, grab your gear. <laughs> grab your gear. We about to go take care of. Brother said, what? what? He said, who is David? Oh, I'm about to show him who David is, right? Um, so he, he snaps on his gear. He like, let's get our swords. Let's go. We about to take care of this, right? But while this is happening, one of the servants run to Abigail, uh, uh, Nabal's wife, until Abigail would just went down. And Abigail was like, he said what to who? You know, I can imagine in Abigail's mind, she's like, don't he know this the one that's in the song that said, you know, Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his ten thousands? What is he doing? He about to, this fool about to get all us killed, right? And so the Bible says uh, in verse 18, Abigail acted quickly. I mean, she jumped to it. Like, I got to be this problem solver. I got to take care of this. I got to fix this before my, my fool of a husband get us all killed, right? And so... In verse 18, it says, Abigail acted quickly. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five seeds of roasted grain, 100 cakes of raisins, and 200 cakes of pressed figs, and loaded them on the donkeys. Uh, so she's like, we about to feed these boys real quick. We got to get it to them, right? Then she told her servants, go on ahead, I'll follow you. But she didn't tell her husband, um, the boss. So she didn't tell him what she was doing. And so she gets there um, and, you know, David had just said in his mind, this is stupid. This is useless. We just about to take this boy out and take uh, take what we need. You know, we didn't even have to ask. We was nice enough to come and ask. We didn't have to ask. We could have just took you out and took all the spoils, right? But um, he like, I'm about to take you out now. Um, and, and he's really upset because he's sort of been... Uh, uh, staying on the outskirts of this man's land. And so, you know, just imagine, you know, the boundaries of his land and and uh, David and his 400 men have sort of been camping around the outskirts of his land. So basically, um, they have been protecting this man's land because anyone who wanted to come in to raid or to steal or to whatever, they would run into David and his men first um, and they would, you know, either they would have to fight with David and his men, or they would be like, you know what, um, the battle rich and everything, but we'll just go somewhere else. And so basically he's been like this man's security guard, his security, um, uh, team for all this time. And all I'm asking you is to feed the team. And this is how you return the favor. David is pissed, y'all. Um, uh, verse 23 says, when Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed down before David with her face to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, pardon your servant, my Lord, and let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. Please pay no attention, my Lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool and folly goes with him. And as for me, your servant, I did not see the man, my Lord said. And now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives, and as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my Lord be like Nabal. And let this gift which your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the men who follow you. Um, and basically, she goes on to say, um, you know, you don't want this stain on your record that you wiped out this whole town just because you got mad, right? You, no, just take this fool, my lord, and go. And my husband, a fool, yes, he was foolish, and foolish, you know, fools do foolish things, right? So my husband followed in his folly, 
Uh, but here's, you know, let's not, let's not, you know, wipe out a whole city over it. And then it's this blemish on your record, right? Uh, so she was a very intelligent, very wise woman. Um, David said to her in verse 32, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, who has kept me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Nabal would have been left alive by daybreak. Uh, basically, David was like, you just caught me, girl. You just caught me. Because if you had not caught me, uh, I was about to take all these men out, like take them all out. Um, so uh, after that, David, you know, uh, goes on a little while. Um, Abigail goes back, tells her husband what happens. Um, and, you know, he's like, what? <laughs> you know, um, and the Bible describes it as uh, his heart failed him. So now we're getting scared, right? His heart failed him and became like stone. And then about 10 days later, um, the Lord just struck him and he died, right? Um, and so what does um, David does do? What does David do? He takes Abigail as a wife, right? He's like, oh, your husband dead? Girl, you that smart girl. Come be my wife, right? Now, David already had two wives, right? Remember, he was given Saul's daughter. Uh, but Saul took his daughter back. He was he was an Indian giver with his daughter. When he fell out, uh, remember when Micah helped him? Um, she put, you know, something in the bed. And when her father came, um, she was like, I mean, when her father's men came, she was like, I don't know where David at, right? And it slowed down process. Well, he got mad from that point. He, he took her and gave her to somewhere else. So now she was no longer David's wife. And so um, he had took another wife along the way. Her name was uh, He Noam, I think, um, of Jezreel. Uh, and so now he's got Abigail as well. So he's been married three times, but he's only got two wives right now. Um, and um, uh, so Abigail got out of, uh, not only uh, saved herself, but becomes David's wife. Uh, ultimately will be um, uh, living in the palace, right, with David when it's all said and done. Um, and that is the end of chapter 25. We are going to continue on. Um, with more stories of David being on the run uh, from Saul. Um, and we're going to actually end the book of 1 Samuel in our next video. So stay with us as we continue on. Um, and remember, God loves you and I love you too. You be blessed in Jesus' name.